this is Adam Law once again with a new video for Wanderings with Adam Law. And this is a Torah Parsha video on Parsha's Vayetze. The title of this uh, video today is What Happened to All the Promises? Sometimes when we decide to get more religious, get involved in Vodas Hashem, we have this feeling that everything is going to go our way. We have these beautiful promises promised to us by our rabbis, by the Torah, what we see around us, and we have this vision of what we think is going to be. But then when reality sets in and we realize that Avodah Hashem is Avodah, it's difficult, oftentimes we see things a lot differently. And one of my friends coined this as doing tshuva on your tshuva, repenting on your repentance, meaning is after you become more spiritual and more religious, you see that you were naive and your understanding was youthful and naive, an important part for growth, but nevertheless, it was naive. I call this the Wizard of Oz effect. I Meaning at some point, someone pulls the screen off of the, uh, of the picture and makes you realize that it's not all beautiful singing and davening and cholent and perfect families, but life is hard. And Torah is a method to help you make your life more spiritual and more connected to God. And a very important thing, it's, it's 613 pieces of advice, the Holy Svarim say. But nevertheless, very difficult things will come inevitably. Torah is the way to find a path through that darkness. So this is exemplified in t today's parsha, which is Vietze, where Yaakov leaves Eretz Yisrael after he gets the blessing and the birthright and becomes the person that he thinks he's going to be and everything is going to be his. The blessings of Abraham and Yitzhak are going to go to him. But then he finds his brother, Esau, wants to murder him, and he has to leave the land. All his possessions are stolen from him by, by Eliphaz, the son of Esau, and Yaakov is in a very dark place. And then an amazing thing happens. So we'll speak about that today. So some of the questions I want to deal with today are, what happened to all the blessings and the promises? Matter of fact, when he gets the blessing from his father, this is what it says. May God give you of the dew of the heavens and of the fatness of the earth and abundant grain and wine. People will serve you. Regimes will prostrate themselves to you. Be a lord to your kinsmen and your mother's sons will prostrate themselves to you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. So it gets this inc incredible blessing. Um, one is that he's going to get the actual um, spiritual promise that he's promised. Yaakov was a, a man who sits in tents. He was a tremendous Torah learner, a spiritual person. And he also gets the fatness of the earth, though, the Shemini Aretz, abundant grain and wine. He gets the world as well. Originally, we know there was supposed to be, Yaakov and Esau were supposed to be a partnership where Yaakov would learn Torah and Esau would be a man of the field and support him, be a prince, be a warrior, be a businessman, and they would work together as a team. After Esau's fall, Yaakov necessitated to take the, those blessings as well. So now Yaakov, the, 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 ish, the Ishtam, the pure man who sits in tents, the one who is destined to spirituality, now is forced to enter the world as a man of physicality and get the blessings, the Shemini Aretz that Esau was supposed to get. So he's, he's ready to take on those blessings, but yet we see they're not fulfilled. These promises are not fulfilled. It says um, that people will serve you, your mother's sons will prostrate themselves to you, cursed be those who curse you, and blessed be those who bless you. Well, Yaakov gets none of this because he's basically kicked out of the land, robbed, and has nothing. And now he has to go into exile and face more and more tests, one after another. So again, what happened to the blessings, the promises, when we got the blessings of God and chose to become religious and become more spiritual? What happened to them? Why did things become so difficult? So our Parsha begins. Yaakov departed from Beersheba and went towards Haran. He encountered the place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took from the stones of the place, which he arranged around his head, and lay down in that place. And he dreamt. And behold, a ladder was set earthward, and its top reached heavenward. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, God was standing over him, and he said, I am the Lord your God, of Abraham your father, and God of Isaac. The ground upon which you are lying, to you I will give it, and to your descendants. Your offspring shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread out powerfully, westward, eastward, northward, and southward. And all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you and by your offspring. Behold, I am with you, and I will guard you wherever you go. 
and I will return you to the soil. For I will not forsake you until I will have done what I've spoken about you. Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely God is present in this place, and I did not know. And he became frightened and said, How awesome is this place! There is, this is none other than the abode of God, and this is the gate of the heavens. Jacob arose early in the morning and took the stone that he placed around his head and set it up as a pillar. And he poured oil on its top. And he named that place Beit El. However, Luz was the city's name originally. Then Jacob took a vow. If God will be with me, will guard me on this way that I am going, will give me bread to eat and clothes to wear, and I will return in peace to my father's house, and Hashem will be a God to me. Then this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall become a house of God. And whatever you will give me, I shall repeatedly tithe it to you. This incredible vision called Sulam Yaakov is a nachama. It's a, a feeling of connection that Yaakov gets right before he's about to leave the land. He looks like he's going from the, fry, the frying pan to the fire. He's leaving the land with all the promises. And then he has this incredible vision while resting his head on this rock on the Harabais, which he didn't know was the Harabais, the place where the whole world was created from, the Ebena Shasiyah. He rested his head on that space. And there he saw this tre tremendous vision of an angels going up and down the ladder to heaven and coming down here. And God there promises him all the blessings, which Yaakov was now so unsure about because he had seen that they hadn't come true. Even though they hadn't come true, God nevertheless promises to him that you will be back here and God will protect him. And then Yaakov asks a strange prayer there. He also, I mean, the important part of the prayer is he says, please be with me, be my God, as, as you just said. But he also asks for bread and food, which is a very strange blessing to ask for bread and food when God is promising you everything. Of course, you're going to have bread and food. So what's going on here with this bread and food? It's a strange thing to ask for at this moment of deep spirituality. It's like, yeah, God, you're awesome. You're going to give me everything in the whole world. I'm going to be so connected. You're going to give me my descendants and get the land. Oh, by the way, can I have a sandwich and some, uh, wa some water too? It's like, of course, you can't get any of those things unless you get bread and food. So what's going on with this bread and food? Another interesting thing we need to bring up is the symbolism of rocks. We see Yaakov over and over again, the next number of Parshas, there's these rocks that happen. There's the rocks here, the rock here that he puts his head on when he has his dream. We see here that he makes a, a, a matseva, a pillar, and he pours oil on it. We see here that he rolls a rock away when it comes to um, finding Rachel, his wife. We see that he sets up another mitzvah of rocks when he is dealing with Lavan. Why do rocks continually appear? What is Yaakov's symbolism of rocks? So we're going to deal with these questions. Again, why bread and water are such a mundane thing to pray for? What happened to all the promises that Yaakov was promised? And here God promises them in per, you know, literally. He promises them, yet none of them are fulfilled and things are incredibly difficult for Yaakov through the rest of his journey, even through the rest of his life. So I'm going to answer one of the questions right away because I think it is an important idea to know. Each one of the fathers were building up a structure. The world, according to the Holy Sfarim and the Torah itself, shows that it was going down and down and down. The Midrash compares the world to Tohu and Vohu and darkness from all the generations of Adam and Noah and the flood and everything that had been going on. And then one man, Abraham, changed everything. And he picked up the world with his right hand. But that wasn't enough. There was still all the impurity from the previous world. And then Yitzhak came along and with his left hand lifted it up. And then Yaakov lifted it up with his body. Yaakov lifted it up with his body. He lifted it up the whole world. And we know the three, it says in Mishle, the three-tiered cord will not easily be broken. Yaakov is completely pure, a pure issue. All his children, the 12 children, are completely pure. But Avram and Yitzhak still maintain a teensy, teensy little bit of the dross from the world before. Yaakov is the solidity. He's the body. He's the whole structure. And Yaakov's mita being the structure is rock solid. However, it doesn't look like he's rock solid. We know that he's the pure man, the one who sits in tents. But yet he's involved with all sorts of deception. He has to trick his brother and basically trick his father. And he has to deal with Lavan in a similar way. There's all sorts of, of things which make Yaakov, the pure man, look not so pure. And that actually is one of the things that have been thrown on a libel that's been thrown on the Jewish people throughout our history. Is that we are not 
who we say we are. We're, we're deceitful. We are, are not corrupt in business and other anti-Semitic ideas. So the symbol of the rock, particularly with the oil being poured on it, why Yaakov continually is the rock is, this, is because rock is the symbol of integrity. The Yaakov's test is integrity. And therefore, Yaakov has to learn the way of dealing with the world. And when you're fighting fire, you must use fire to fight fire. We learn in the book of Noam Elimelech that the way to fight Esau is with the sword. It's with this world. Torah is important. Kol kol Yaakov, yedeim yedei Esau. Yaakov has the pure inside, the purity of Torah. But he also must engage in this world. And that is what he becomes. And all these parshas, he... He is a spiritual boy. He learns Torah for 14 years in the yeshiva, Hashem, and Eber. But he must learn to engage in the world for 22 years of Gullus and really for the rest of his life, even in Eretz Yisrael, and even the end and the suffering with, with jo- Yosef. And he must learn to engage and deal with the real problems of the world. That's what the Jew is supposed to do. Not just be ivory tower, be a man of spirit, a yeshiva bacher, but be a man in the world, a physical man, a man of strength. Like we're seeing the Jews of Eretz Yisrael returning to the land and becoming men of strength and not just weak men, men of spirituality. You must have both. And Yaakov is the perfect man, Ishtam, who has both. But he's continually questioned because as the spiritual man, he must engage in the ways of the world. And when he engages in the way of the world, he gets dirty. He has to fight Esau by wearing Esau's skin, the dirtiness. And therefore, his symbol, Yaakov's symbol, is the rock. Because no matter what, you can just wash off the dirt off a rock. Rock is pure, it's clean. It's a symbolism of the spirituality of the oil, the wisdom being poured on the rock. That Yaakov, no matter what it looks like he's doing, always maintains his inner Yaakov status, his kol kol Yaakov. Even if he has a Yedayamide Esav, even if he must engage in the world and fight in the world and kill his enemies and trick them and, and stuff. He doesn't want to do this. He doesn't want to engage in the world. It's always done with integrity. As it says in Mishle, when dealing with the slanted, make yourself subtle. Meaning is, when you're dealing with corrupt people, being a tzaddik isn't enough. You must engage in the ways of the world with integrity. And therefore, Yaakov's symbol is the rock, the rock of integrity, that no matter what he does. So getting back to the rock here, I want to bring down a mind-blowing Torah of the Kedusha Slavi. Here in the Parsha, as Yaakov leaves, it says he left Be'er Sheva, the spiritual level of Be'er Sheva, the Shabbos, the holiness of Eretz Yisrael, and went to Haran. Haran means af, Haran af. Haran is anger. It goes to the place of exile, of anger, of divine anger, of, of, of separation. And there he rests his head on a rock. And the Midrashim explained that the rock, there were 12 rocks that he put around his head and they all became one rock. What's going on with resting his head on the rock? And why are these 12 rocks that become one? So the Kedusha Slavi has this mind-blowing idea. He says, Yaakov Avinu at that moment when he rests his head on the rock, he gazed into the supernal unity from the beginning of creation. Again, this rock was the rock which the whole world was founded on, the connection between the physical and the spiritual, this world and the other world. As we said, Yaakov had to become a man of this world. He saw that this idea, this rock, the rock, the Eben Shasiyah, was the foundation of all the worlds, and that's Knesset Yisrael, the Jewish people. As it says, Yisrael Allah v'makshava, the first thought that God had when he created the world was that there would be a nation called Israel. It says this in Bereshit Rabbah. All the things in the Torah, everything, the whole creation of the world was that there would be a nation called Israel which would bring God's name, monotheism, into the world. And that was the reason that God created the world. And that's when Yaakov rests his head in the rock, it's this rock, the rock of creation, which is this idea there would be something called Israel, a, a country, a people, an idea, that would be the foundation of the world, that there'd be, God would be in the world, that we would make a dira taktonim, we'd bring God's light into the world. Yaakov put his head on that rock, meaning he saw that he was going to be the one to bring the spiritual idea, which was existing before of all creation, according to Bereshit Rabbah, the idea of Israel as the holy people, and he was going to become this. He realized what the purpose and the meaning of the world was, and he decided he knew that this is what he was going to become, this incredible vision, that this world was connected to the upper worlds by a ladder. And Yaakov, Israel, was going to be the vehicle to bring light down and light back up again, up the ladders. And that's the angels going up and down the ladder. And he's, that's why the 12 rocks become into one, because now Yaakov, the third tiered cord, the final of the three avos, 
he was going to be the one that all his children were going to be pure. All 12 of the children, the 12 rocks into one, were going to be unified. That everything was going to be unified in Yaakov. And he was going to be the one to become Yisrael, to become the one to start the whole thing, to bring the Jewish people into existence. However, in his Ruach HaKodesh, he saw all the gullises and the destructions and all the suffering that was going to happen. And it was very painful for him. He saw everything that was going to be in the Dinim and how everything was going to be so difficult. And he needed to see this right at the moment he was about to leave the land to go into exile because this is what he needed to know. He needed to realize that it wasn't going to be easy. The path was not going to be easy. That Yaakov was going to be the one to bring this idea into the world, but his life and his children's life all the way now until redemption was going to be a story of exile. And this is the lesson he needed to know. That the blessings and the promises were going to be promised to him did not mean just the spiritual level above, but this world too. He needed to engage in this world. And this world is a place of darkness, of suffering, of pain, right? And that's the harshest of the rock as well. Kedusha Slefi adds that the angels were going up and down from the exile and back into Eretz Israel on this ladder. And each one of these represented the holy sparks that Yaakov and his children would have to get first in the Midbar, in the desert, when the Jews were wandering, but also throughout all Gullus, all the holy gear and the holy sparks that he had to turn towards Kedusha, towards holiness. This is what Yaakov would have to do to engage in the physicality of the world, the difficulty of the world, the struggle against exile and pain. This is Yaakov's mission. Then it says, he woke up from his sleep and he said, God is in this place because he realized that God is also in the darkness, in the darkest place, and that God would be with him. And that's why God promises him, I will be with you no matter what. And Yaakov realizes it. And it becomes who he becomes. He becomes the person who can walk through the darkness, who can see that this world, the physical place, is a place of spirituality, that it all must be uplifted, that yes, we become religious because we want all the promises, but the promises will be fulfilled in the one who realizes that this world, the dark world, is the place of the promises now. Other promises will be reserved for the next world, but we must engage in this world, become men of this world. And that was the bracha of Tshmini Aretz, of the fat of the land, that Esau's bracha, of this world would also be given to Yaakov, which means all the pain and suffering of this world would also go along with it. But Yaakov says, behold, God is in this place, meaning as he realizes that this is where God is, also in that place, because God is omnipresent. God is one. All is included within him. Therefore, there's no such thing as being removed from God. And this is what gave him the Hama. This has given him consolation for what he was about to go through. Rabbi Nassim Abraslov says, that, that's what it says, Yifka B'makom. It says that Yaakov left Beersheba, the spiritual world called Beersheba, and went towards Harana. Haron, the Haron Af, the anger, the pain of exile. Then it says, Yifka B'makom. But he connected to God at that place. He realized that God is also to be found in those dark spaces. And now he had to do it. Now he had to actually engage in the world and become a man of strength and be able to engage in the world and his integrity be in question. But Yaakov is the one. Emma's the Yaakov. The truth is with Yaakov, that no matter what it looks like from the outside and that how bad the Jewish people would have it, we should, we should never have despair. We should always have hope in the blessings, the promises that God will give us. And he's moving us towards redemption, no matter what the darkness is at all times. And this is specifically why Yaakov asks, please give me bread and clothes, because these garments and, and food are not just things that we wear and eat. It represents the engagement in the world. It's easy to learn Torah and be spiritual, but what's hard is to engage in the world and bring God into the world. And that's why Yaakov asked specifically, why bread and why clothes? Meaning is, even in this world, the physicality of this world, I will engage. That is my blessing, the blessing of Esau, that I will not only fix the upper worlds, that's easy for me, but the lower worlds as well. That's the real challenge. That's where the Jews' real challenge is, to operate in this world with integrity, with strength, with might, and holiness, despite suffering, despite exile. But nobody said it was going to be easy. Avodah Hashem means avoda, it means work. And this is what Yaakov sees. He becomes the person who brings the spiritual idea of the first thought of the world, of Israel. And he wants it, and he desires it, and he brings it into reality. But that also means he must take on the pain of the exile of this world. And he does so. And that was the promise, that Yaakov would be able to engage both worlds and become the person he could be. Thank you very much. This is Parshas Vyetze. Today we looked at the Noam Elimelech, the Kedusha Slevi, 
and Rabbi Nassim and Lukate Halachos. I hope you have a great Shabbos. Thank you very much. This is Adam Law.